Hi everyone, thank you very much for tuning in today. My name is Maddie Potter and I'm an associate in the English department at the University of York and a visiting research fellow at Edge Hill University's E219 Research Centre. And my presentation today is entitled Death Teeming In by Her Portholes Unmaking in GM Hopkins's The Loss of the Eurydice. Let me then begin with some brief context surrounding the real life events which prompted GM Hopkins' 1878 poem The Loss of the Eurydice. The Eurydice was a small warship, a 26 gun Royal Navy Corvette which in 1878 was involved in one of the worst naval tragedies um, in Britain in times of peace. Coming back from the uh, Royal Naval Dockyard uh, in Bermuda and en route to Portsmouth, the ship was um, was caught in a severe snowstorm just off Dunnose Cape uh, off the Isle of Wight and capsized and sank. Out of its 319 crew, there were only two survivors. For the Jesuit poet and priest Jim Hopkins, this led to questions surrounding the nature of tragedy and God's role in allowing and permitting for such a tragedy to happen. As the lines, deeply surely I need to deplore it, wondering why my master bore it, demonstrate so clearly. The haunting, wondering why my master bore it, demonstrates Hopkins's questioning of God's will in allowing for the loss of uh, lives in this naval tragedy. As Peter Millward writes in an article about the rhythm of the loss of the Eurydice, this is arguably one of Hopkins's least popular poems. Millward takes us on a survey of reactions to and reviews of Hopkins's work, ranging from um, Elizabeth Schneider calling it uh, a strange production and a sad failure to um, Jim Hunter referring to it as exhibiting a, I quote, strange vulgarity and it being a self parody. Upon receiving a rejection for publication uh, from the Jesuit magazine The Month for this poem, Jim Hopkins wrote in a letter to Robert Bridges in 1879 that, I quote, No doubt my poetry errs on the side of oddness. I hope in time to have a more balanced and Miltonic style, but as air, melody is what strikes me most of all in music and design and painting, so design pattern, or what I am in the habit of calling inscape, is what I above all aim at in poetry. Upon rereading the poem, Hopkins himself admitted that, I quote, it struck me aghast with a kind of raw nakedness and unmitigated violence I was unprepared for. But take breath and read it with the ears, as I always wish to be read, and my verse becomes all right. What I want to propose in this paper, then, is that the theological journey of Hawkins's loss of the Eurydice parallels that aesthetic move from violence to it being all right and yet that within this development of violence especially in the context of drowning at sea is a necessary step within this discovery of one dimension of divine knowledge. It is important to stress, as we have seen from Hopkins's letter to Bridges, that for him the aesthetic epistemological achievement of a poem resides within the um, idea of inscape. Looking at a dead tree, Hopkins in one of his journals mused over the inscape markedly holding its most simple and beautiful oneness up from the ground through a graceful swerve below. What is interesting here is that Hopkins is observing a tree, hence his perspective is landlocked at this stage and the idea of inscape is woven into this observation 
of an object within a land-bound perspective. Although Hopkins is undoubtedly aiming for the same achievement of Inscape and the loss of the Eurydice, what we notice initially in this oceanic context is actually a loss of that oneness and unity he attributes to the experience of Inscape, both in terms of the object of contemplation and as the technical and formal achievement of the poem. A loss which is cleverly anticipated through the title itself, The Loss of the Eurydice. Now, let me turn back to the quotation I have included on the previous slide surrounded Hop surrounding Hopkins's uh, understanding of Enscape as he muses over a dead tree. I want to stress the importance of death here. Hopkins is clearly looking at an object which had been living and is now dead. And yet, within this landlocked perspective, he is nonetheless experiencing this sense of unity which leads to um, inscape. It is not the loss of life itself, then, which creates that destabilization in the loss of the Eurydice, but it is the loss of unity and potential inscape. The loss of the Eurydice announces itself as a destabilizing poem of disorder, as indicated by the stanza I have included here on the slide. This was that fell capsize as half she had righted and hoped to rise, death teeming in by her portholes, raised down decks, round messes of mortals. The capsizing as well, the scrambled effort to half right itself, hoping to rise or indicate the unbound, untamable and messy force of this liquid death which is surrounding the helpless mariners at sea. The phrase messes of mortals itself subtly references the idea of mess as used to designate in uh, the 18th and 19th uh, sailing, 19th century sailing era, um, an area where military personnel or sailors would socialise, eat and at times even live and it's used by, um, um, by extension to refer to a group of sailors. At the same time, of course, messes of mortals reinforces this idea of disorder which is surrounding um, the sailors at sea, while the replacement of humans or potentially men with mortals emphasises the precarity of their situation in front of this watery death. In an essay on Paul Tillan and the recovery of language, Charles Taylor describes human beings as language beings and um, explores what things might have looked like without the existence of language. Um, I quote, Take spirit, ruach, pneuma. Well, wind would be there for us even if we had remained prelinguistic animals. We might seek shelter from it and breathing would be there as we gasp for breath running. But spirit, not that gift, that rushing, that onset of strength to reach for something higher, something fuller. In her introduction to Oceanic Studies, Hester Bloom proposes that rather than organising and systematising landlocked perspectives, the sea, I quote, provides a new epistemology. The question I want to ask then is, how does this new epistemology at sea, derived from a landlocked perspective, translate into the use of language, as Charles Taylor has theorised it, in terms of instantiating human experience and creating a reality which is perceived by human beings? I want to propo propose that the disorder we find in the loss of the Eurydice, both um, thematically and linguistically and in addition formally as well, suggests the impossibility of a landlocked language to be applied within this um, oceanic context which Hopkins is engaging with in this poem. 
The poem then is one of linguistic, aesthetic and theological unmaking and remaking. Stanza 17, for example, resorts to negative language to describe the deathly seascape which surrounds one of the drowning sailors. Now he sheets short up to the round air, now he gasps, now he gazes everywhere, but as I no cliff, no coast or mark makes in the revealing snowstorm. The all-encompassing expansive idea of everywhere would warrant some descriptive fleshing out, especially from a poet as invested in the idea of hexaity, of thisness, as G.M. Hopkins is. However, as if caught in a network of Derridian deference, where meaning is always promised but never delivered, Hopkins leaves his readers only wanting more, and the description of the seascape is only uh, delivered through negative definition in connection to a landlocked perspective. There is no cliff nor any coast that the mariner's eye can make out. This is perhaps an uncharacteristic and surprising mechanism for a poet who usually dwells on the preciseness and immediacy of things and beings in order to derive from there a sense of epistemology of the divine, as he famously does in As Kingfisher's Catch Fire when contemplating the immediacy of the landscape uh, before him and of the created beings uh, inhabiting that landscape. He contends that the just man justices keeps grace that keeps all his goings graces acts in god's eye what in god's eye he is christ for christ plays in ten thousand places lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his to the father through the features of men's faces in these lines hopkins finds and locates Christ within the created world, within humanity. Hexaity or thisness is then an invaluable mechanism for theological discovery, unveiling the theological axiom of humanity being created in God's image. In its act of contemplation and intellectual ideation, Hopkins's poem there um, parallels Aquinas' theological assertion that the imago dei, that is the image of God, is located primarily within the human mind. At the same time, by zooming in on what in the Windhover he has called the achiever of the mastery of the thing, he highlights the sensory, sensuous and artistic achievement of nature and of humanity itself in perfect communion with um, the divine image of humanity itself upon creation. Thisness then is a means of finding Christ within the world, of finding Christ within humanity, that is of locating the divine within the human. And when I say locating the divine within the human, I do not I do not mean that humanity is a perfect mirror of the divine. Instead, I mean that it is a highlighting of those attributes in humanity which do reflect to um which do reflect um the creator's imprint on human nature and on natural human disposition. Because it highlights this divine aspect of human nature as kingfishers catch fire can be described as a christing poem in its hexaetic focus hopkins is it alliterative sprung rhythm poised towards the inscape of the poem itself contributes this to this christing hexaity by contrast the loss of the eurydice can be described as an unchristing poem a term which G.M. Hopkins himself uses, uh, albeit in a slightly different form, which is unchrist. Only the breathing temple and fleet life, this 
wild worth blown so sweet these dare deaths i this crew in unchrist all rolled in ruin the individuating process of thisness by which Hopkins locates Christ um, at the heart of humanity in as kingfishers catch fire is undone and unmade here amongst the ruinous vast waterscapes. It seems as if the only certainty is that of God's absence, is that of the unchrist. However, linguistically, and by extension, conceptually and philosophically, Christ is still present in the collocation and Christ. Christ remains the focus of the negative term un-Christ. And while here Hopkins seemingly abandons hexaity, it is only a landlocked hexaity that he abandons. In its place, he discovers a new oceanic hexaity and forges a new linguistic and formal register to find the poem's liquid inscape. We can notice here in the stanza new compounds such as Wildworth and Dare Deaths, suggesting that while well, through Unchrist, Hopkins is abandoning the grounded hexaity of his Christing poems, he is nonetheless discovering a new type of Christing, a new type of mirroring of the divine, however, this time located not in the human, but in the sea itself and its effects, as we shall see uh, shortly. Amidst the tessellation at sea, the reference to a breathing temple and fleet suggest an improbable sense of victory, intimated an unexpected sense of a Christ triumph triumphant rising from the very deathly waves of this ruination at sea. Once the poem abandons the ideal of unity inherent in that landlocked um, perspective of poetic inscape, it slowly but steadily discover, discovers a new type of liquid poetic inscape, which views the experience of humanity tied in and unified with the very idea of death at sea. The hyphenated compound C corpse, which we encounter in stanza 19, perhaps most poignantly captures this newfound um, unity of inscape. So, um, in stanza 19, then followed by 20, Hopkins writes, They say he saw one sea corpse cold, he was all of lovely manly mould, every inch a tar of the best we boast our sailors are. Look foot to forelock how all things suit, he is strung by duty, is strained to beauty, and brown as dawning skinned with brine and shine and whirling wind. A sense of unexpected beauty pervades the corpse of drowned sa of the drowned sailor here. He is made one with the sea in which he perished, and which embellishes him with brine and shine and whirling wind. There is a sense of strained beauty, as Hopkins himself indicates here, but nonetheless of beauty. In a sense, then, the corpse of the drowned sailor seems to finally achieve that same sense of inscape and unity which Hopkins identified in the dead tree, which I referenced at the beginning of this presentation. However, it is only through the discovery of a new type of Christing aquatic experience that this is made possible. In other words, it is made possible only by the hyphenated condition of the sea corpse, of the brown as dawning skinned with brine and shine and whirling wind body of the sailor in this particular case. It is important to note that this unchristing and liquid rechristing at sea does not entail the abandonment of um, Hopkins's hexaetic theology. Instead, it reflects a different dimension of it, 
and its application within an oceanic context, removed and independent from the anthropocentric landlocked perspective, which informs some of his other poetry, such as uh, As King Fishers Catch Fire, which I have used here to uh, illustrate and contrast uh, his liquid theology with. It is also a theology which arguably demonstrates that which uh, the contemporary theologian William Desmond has referred to as the experience of God through the shudder of dread. As I approach a conclusion, then I want to propose that the kind of re-Christing we encounter in the loss of the Eurydice unveils a kind of hexatic Hopkinsian sense of the sublime. Edmund Burke's theorization of the sublime as located in whatever is in any sort of terrible or conversant about terrible objects seems to find a kind of Thomistic theological fulfillment in Hopkins's The Loss of the Eurydice here, in that it is not the experience of terror which is um, a source of an epistemology of the divine or of transcendence, but rather that this desolation we experience at sea actually locates images of the divine and of Christ within landscape while attempting as much as possible to abandon an anthropocentric or human focused um, viewpoint. This is my bibliography slide. Thank you very much for listening and I look forward to hearing your thoughts and I'm very happy to answer any questions and chat to everybody during the live day events of the conference. Thank you again.